Shalom, Havarim, Shalom. Just to, to address this fundamental point right here, there's this misperception that when we're speaking about Hebrew, even biblical Hebrew, one's confused Hebrew with Yiddish. So let's address this point right here that Hebrew is not Yiddish. Yiddish is not Hebrew and Hebrew is not Yiddish. And this is surprising because there's many debates and discussions and dialogues, either those who are pro Bible, you know, those who are against the Bible or seeking to bring out contradiction and errors. And everyone dances around the linguistic significance of the matter, right? And many would fall into this wrong perception that Hebrew and Yiddish is one and the same language because of the European, many Eastern European Jews, some of them refer to themselves as Ashkenazi Jews, right, have a Germanic, a Germanic background. Now, Hebrew has and does somehow influence Yiddish, and many Yiddish speakers who are German, right, Germanic speakers, they have adopted from their best pronunciation and understanding Hebrew and Hebrew terms. I was listening to a little debate between one named Chris and one named um, Apostle on Sarnetta's platform, the Black Conscious platform. And they're going back and forth over certain areas of interpretations. Chris is seeking to point out contradictions. And this one named Apostle, a kind of an elder, um, can I say an Israelite, you know, an elder brother, elder gentleman, he is seeking to defend right the bible and the scriptures and he often mentions about knowledge of hebrew and how hebrew is you know important to know and to learn yet at a particular point of their back and forth in their discussion chris called on apostle he, he called him cohen cohen right he's a cohen 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 either say cohen or cohen right and apostle responded and he said um don't like don't call me that and then he he mentioned that it was y yiddish i said whoa because this is the same one one of the few ones that even points to not really goes into depths on it right because i don't think that his his skill or ability is on that particular level too but he knows enough to know that the hebrew right the hebrew is the real authority on the scriptures and not the english or the king james different translations or versions but it shocked me right when Chris said to him, Kohen, Kohen, like to, almost like to say, hold up, hold up for a moment, priest. And he said, this is priest. And he said, no. He said, that's Yiddish. That's not Hebrew. I said, what? I said, what? Say what? I said, wow. I said, I got to address this right here. And then Chris responded in saying that Hebrew is Yiddish. And he's the one who's more a little scholarly, goes into, you know, different research. And sometimes argues his point well whether we agree with some of his conclusions yeah some of his conclusions or not right he does seem to have a more scholarly approach you know one who will go and look up different things and brings in different evidences but yet according to him he said the reputed um a revivalist right lexicographer right of the first hebrew dictionary the lexicographer that was eliezer ben yehuda he's a linguist they call him a hebrew linguist a, a grammarian a journalist and he's also the renowned lexicographer lexicographer of the first hebrew dictionary and the editor of of of, of hazivi hazvi hazvi one of the first hebrew newspapers published in the Eretz Yisrael. Now when I say Eretz Yisrael, some, even some Hebrews and Hebrew Israelites, even among my people, they'll say, oh, woo, 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 you're speaking Yiddish. I said, no, 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 this is Hebrew. They say, no, it's Yiddish. And many will say that Hebrew is Yiddish. Hebrew is not Yiddish. Now, we're not the first to say this right here, but maybe in this community of people, we have to be the first to make the fact known that Hebrew is not Yiddish. You see, one of the problems is, is that, you know, the popular Jews, the Ashkenazi and the European Jews, right, who are, you know, known and have made themselves known to represent, quote, what is called Judaism and all things related to Jew and Jewry, right, they have a Germanic influence within their own, let's say this like this, mother tongue. And when you get into linguistics, and linguistic science is so important, 
right, to clarifying a lot of the misconceptions that are found in the KJV or the King James Version of the Bible and due to errors, right, in translation and even errors in transliteration, right? But now, Eliezer ben Yehuda, he it was the one of the main driving forces, right, behind what is called the revival of Hebrew, right, or modern Hebrew. Now, he lived... You know, between the um, times of, I think he was born in 18, January 7th, actually. January 7th, 1858, right? Let's touch on this right here. 1858, and he died December 16th, 1922. This is him right here, right? This is the one we're speaking of, Eliezer ben Yehuda. And then we heard Chris say that, well, Eliezer ben Yehuda, you know, even the one who revived the Hebrew language, who's credited with the revival of modern Hebrew, even he says so. He does not say so. But yet, he uses his mother tongue, right? His mother tongue, right? His mother tongue, the Germanic mother tongue, you know, known as Yiddish. Now, what is Yiddish? Let's get a definition. Let's touch on a definition of Yiddish right here. Let's bring this up right here. So the first thing we, we put in was Hebrew and Yiddish. Right, Hebrew and Yiddish, because ones if you're not, not able to distinguish, hold on for a moment. Ring the alarm! Ring the alarm! Yes, yes, yes. Ring the alarm! If you're not able to distinguish Hebrew from Yiddish, then you expressing that you don't know one or the other. It's very clear you don't. Right, and this is one of the critical mistakes a lot of otherwise pretty good scholars, right, in their particular discipline and their particular approach right to presenting their arguments make right so when we heard chris say you know he said that hebrew is yiddish and yiddish is hebrew right and then when we heard apostle who sees to who seems to be defending you know we have to get into the linguistic and the language of the hebrew and and, and about the translation a, a similar reasoning right that many of us do make so on that point we say he's right and accurate but when chris called him kohane my Kohen, he says, he said, that is Yiddish, <laughs> but that is not Yiddish. And then Chris said that Hebrew is Yiddish. So even on the both sides of this argument, Chris is somebody that basically wants to, you know, you could say um, dismiss, expose, you know, the Abrahamic, Jude, you know, Judeo-Christian Abrahamic religions, whether it's of the, the Torah, you know, the New Testament Bible, or, or the Quran, you know, that's his pr approach and, and seeking to a more what he calls a African spirituality. But get this right here. Hebrew is a Semitic is regarded according to the academics and also academic consensus. A lot of them like to play the academic consensus card. Well, let's play that academic consensus card, right? Hebrew is a Semitic right? or some might say Shemitic, but here Hebrew is a Semitic language. Now look open parenthesis what does it say a subgroup of the afro asiatic languages even if he would say that creation and the birth of a uh, human and humanity right or a modern homo sapien sapien began in in africa right we have to recognize that they didn't just sit down in one place the earth is what, what they say earth is the law is the fullness thereof Right, so, but notice Afro-Asiatic. What is first? Afro. Afro, right, is a short form that refers to Africa, right, and from a biblical perspective to the the Ham, that Ham, you know, Ham or Ham, right, or Kam or Kem, where some will say Kem or Kemetic, so forth and so on. So that's the Afro. Notice when Hebrew is defined according to linguistic science. Right? It's defined as a Shemitic language. Actually, in older dictionaries, it was defined as an Afro-Semitic. And in many other dictionaries, too, still keep the correct um, definition, academic definition, that Hebrew, and it's more like Biblical Hebrew, Ancient Hebrew, the Hebrew of the Israelites, or what's called, a more proper name would be Yehudit, Yehudit. But that's a whole other matter there. Let's just reason on this. That Hebrew is a Semitic, Mobeta, Afro-Semitic language, a subgroup of the Afro-Asiatic languages. Languages spoken across the so-called the Pseudo-Middle East. 
And we say the Middle East, that includes, right, east of the River Nile in Africa, you know, what's called Africa, east of the River Nile. And what's interesting that we find also a lot of African, you know, different African communities, right, and different references, right, to black Jews, Yehudi, black Israelites within those particular regions of the world in that same region that today politically since World War II is called the Middle So-Called East. Check out our video where we break that down. It's a video on Rastafari Jews where we break down the pseudoness of the so-called Middle East and how it's a political nomenclature, political wording, right? But now, that is Hebrew, right? We're showing you this all right here, 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 right? This, this should settle it, but we have backup, right, for the backup. While Yiddish... So what's the difference between Hebrew and Yiddish? Now, if he, why didn't they say that Hebrew is Yiddish? They could say that right here, that Hebrew is Yiddish. Did they say that Hebrew is Yiddish? No, they didn't say that Hebrew is Yiddish. What did they say? They say that Hebrew is a Shemitic, a Semitic language, and it's a subgroup. That means, according to the linguistic and academic science, it like descends from the Afro, to say the African Asiatic, right? Some talk about the Asiatic black man because the real truth of the matter, right, is that ancient man, right, was so-called melanated or what we would call black, right? And even if he began or emanated, so to speak, you know what I mean, from the African continent, what we call the African continent today, right, we see his, his fingerprints all over, right, this earthly plane. Right? This is where this, the out of Africa theory, so forth and so on. We, yes, we know that that theory is, you know, being challenged. Where some say it wasn't just in Africa, but that humanity sprung up in many different places of the earthly plane, even simultaneously. That's a whole other argument, reasoning. Just sharing this with the audience right here. But if Hebrew was Yiddish, it would be easy enough for you to find something that says Hebrew is Yiddish. Only those who are ignorant... When I say ignorance, they don't know. Or they are ignoring, they are ignoring willfully the facts of the matter. And we're presenting right here the receipts and the facts of the matter. That Hebrew is a Semitic or more correctly an Afro-Semitic. But here it states a Semitic language, but then it breaks down to Afro, right? The Kamo, Kamo Shemitic, Hamo Semitic. So they used to say before, Hemito-Semitic. So in the biblical narrative, that means that the children and descendants of the one they called Ham or Ham and the children of Shem, right, they had a common linguistic dialect among these two descendants according to the biblical narrative of Noah or Noah, right? While Yiddish, Yiddish is a German dialect which integrates many languages. That means it basically borrows, it's like English. Like English is like a Frankenstein, right? English, we call English, is a Frankenstein language. You remember the movie Frankenstein and how the monster, you know, Frankenstein was put together from a lot of different parts, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Like, you know what I mean? This is similar to the language, the German, the German dialect known as Yiddish, Hebrew, and especially biblical Hebrew is not a German or a Germanic dialect. But you have many speakers, speaking about the Ashkenazi and other German European Jews, whose mother tongue, speaking of the Germanic, the Gomorite, the, you know, when we look at Ashkenaz in the scripture, we can tell that he is not descended from Shem, right? So they adapt because of their belief, right, since 740 A.D., very good book by Shlomo Sands that speaks about when certain Eastern European peoples adopted right, the Israelite or Judaic culture as their own. Right? So this is why there is such a strong Yiddish or Germanic influence right, nowadays amongst what we would call Hebrew or Jews. You know, there's a lot of points of reference because it relates to their own so-called integration or coming into this Afro-Asiatic, this Afro-Shemitic, right? This Afro-Shemitic, we could say, linguistic, 
culture, and if you please, even you can say religion in the sense of Judaism and Judaic, but all of those can be solved once you have a good groundation. And once we heard one say that that Kohen, Apostle said that Kohen is is Yiddish. I said, what, 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 what? Kohen is Yiddish, right? And then Chris said that Hebrew is Yiddish. And I was surprised that he said that. And he went on to say that Eliezer ben Yehuda. I mean, we've heard him make certain mistakes in his zeal, right? In his zeal to make his particular point. But this just gives us the opportunity to clarify it with our viewers and like, share, subscribe, share this with others. Because this point has to be understood. Has to be understood clearly. Because this is stopping a lot of one's growth and study and learning. Right? Because many ones believe, even when we go through the Hebrew, we even go through the different dialects. We say this is a Afro-Shemitic, according to the African Shemitic dialect. Right? This is said like this. Yeah, heal up the Pharaoh said that. Yeah. You know, the Afro-Shemitic dialect. And then we say, okay, this is like the Mardin Hebrew. You know, giving, you know, certain words, you know, for example. And we can go through that a little bit right here as well. But this is the point that we would like to make very clear. That Yiddish is a Germanic dialect. Yiddish has its roots, right, in the pre-Judaic, the pre-Jewish, right, adoption of the European Jews, right? Especially the Ashkenazi Jews, right? So this was their pre-Jewish, right? Or Hebrew adoption. So they had this language, we call it linguistically their mother tongue, their mother tongue, right? It's a very important area of linguistics that's often not really addressed in the consciousness community. Hopefully this will become a point, their mother tongue, how our mother tongue you know, like right now, if somebody has, uh, they're from down south, right? And they have a southern, you know, accent or dialect, or they're from the Caribbean, right? Sometimes when they're learning, say, Hebrew or biblical Hebrew, just the basic, you know, phonetics and sounds, we can hear, you can hear still the pre Hebrew dialect, you know what I mean? The way we speak, in other words, how we speak, say whatever language is the our birth or born language, right? Sometimes affects, right, how we speak another language. This is often very difficult for many students. For many students, even though mentally they are learning, they, they know what they know, they compare their enunciation, their pronunciation with maybe a native speaker and there is the difference right there. You know, there is the difference. It's something that we go through even in our, you know, tutoring, you know, of the different linguistics and languages and also going through the particular studies, Rastafari discipleship, Rastafari sabbatical, you know, Rastafari rabbi studies that we go through. You know, this is something that we try to kind of um, 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 prepare, you know, ones and ones for. So even though you're learning whether we're teaching the, the basics of the Biblical Hebrew or the Royal Amharic, your dialect, your accent, don't worry about the accent. You see, sometimes people like to say things the way they hear somebody, like to repeat the way they, they say it, but they're not really learning the mechanics, you know, the fundamental mechanics, you know, the grammar, you know, the roots of the languages. But the first thing we have to clarify is that Hebrew is not Yiddish, and Yiddish is a German dialect that integrates many languages, just like English. So in other words, we can compare Yiddish, what is called Yiddish, a Germanic dialect that integrates and incorporates many different words from different languages, right? Including German, right? Hebrew, Aramaic and various Slavic and Romance languages. And that's speaking about Roman languages or Latin, right? Latin-based languages, right? Many, what we could say, European, right? Or Latin Romance, the Romance language, or like the Roman languages, like considering like Latin. So that means that while Hebrew is a Shemitic, a Semitic language, right? And it's an Afro-Asiatic, it's an Afro-African, to clarify it for the audience, an African Shemitic language, right? 
that does not incorporate German or German dialects originally biblically. Yiddish being a German dialect, it integrates and incorporates many other languages, both languages that are, we could say, um, Japhetic, right? If we look at German in that sense, Japhetic, even the Ashkenazi, we have that in the Bible, and that's related to Gomer and Japheth, right? As well as more purely Shemitic, the Hebrew, the Aramaic, right? And also other European languages like Slavic. In fact, Hebrew, I mean, Yiddish, Yiddish is very Slavic. And, you know, we, we, we touched on the word slave, Slav, and in relation to the word slave, a very interesting, we also touched on that in another video. So, do we have this right here? Do we understand this right here? Right? Now, if you can bring up real evidence, because there are even those people who are speakers, there's many Yiddish speakers and European Jews themselves who basically say and prove the same thing. What is the difference between Yiddish and Hebrew? Therefore, if there's a difference between Yiddish and Hebrew, it means that Yiddish is not Hebrew and Hebrew is not Yiddish. But amongst modern and latter day peoples and what we say popular Judaism, right? And the European Jews, you know what I mean? Have influenced, right? What we call Judaism and even biblical studies with their own mother tongue, right? And many are not able to discern right between the two for example you have words that are hebrew that because of the european ashkenazi and yiddish speaking jews because of their religious you know identification they incorporate hebrew terms right and even names into their speech it's almost like when we hear somebody speaking spanish Right? And they might go from Spanish to English or many other languages. There are many speakers who are like, you know, bi or trilingual, right? And sometimes they'll speak a little bit of this. We was watching some African movies and it was interesting. Some of them were speaking Hausa, Hausa, some speak of Zulu, I think it's Iwana, right? While they spoke English, so they'll go back and forth. Sometimes just a couple of words here, right? In Zulu, or a couple of words here in Hausa a couple of words here in Tsawana, and then a couple of words here in English. So we can see even how other peoples would incorporate right, other languages and linguistics that they encounter and sometimes are forced to deal with right, in other you know, regions of the world. But so Hebrew, biblical, the, the knowledge of the Bible has influenced the Ashkenazi Right, and this mainly is the Ashkenazi branch, right, which is the most popular, we could say, branch, right? And so when people speak about Jew and being Jew, often the point of reference within this world and world system usually points to them, right? This is what makes many people believe, well, this whole Jewish thing is basically belongs to the European or European Jews, yet the European Jews and many of their scholars point out when this particular faith, right, was adopted right by them and one of the best dates that have been given even by scholars from hebrew university and elsewhere shlomo sands is 740 a.d seven i wanted you to keep in mind 740 a.d right so this yiddish germanic influence right from 740 a.d has increased to what we have today in 2023 right yet and still, that does not make Hebrew Yiddish or Yiddish Hebrew. So here we have some Hebrew to Yiddish names like Ephraim, 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 right? In the Hebrew, Ephraim, 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 like Ephraim, right? But Ephraim becomes in Yiddish Froim, Froim, Froim. So you hear the word Froim, right? Froim is how the Yiddish Germanic dialect mother tongue speakers would say the biblical Hebrew Ephraim, Ephraim. You see, they drop the Aleph. The Aleph is dropped. How about another Hebrew name, biblical Hebrew name? El Hanon, El Hanan, El Hanan, like El Hanan, El Hanan, El Hanon, El Hanon. 
in modern um, Yiddish, it's it's Chono, 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 Chono. You can see that right there. We're just showing this demonstration right here. So biblically, it has the name of, you could say, the God. Not the name. It's not the name, but the attribute that refers to the power of the Almighty, El, right? And Hanon, right? El Hanon, El Hanon. In Yiddish, is Chono, 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 right? Yeshayahu, Yeshaya, 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 or more reading the Hebrew, Yeshayahu. Yeshayah, 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 Isaiah, Isaias, as some may say, Isaias, Isaiah, Yeshayah. Now you see an I there because that's how they transliterate it. But when you read the Hebrew, it's that yo, Yeshayah. Sometimes it's written with the wow at the end, so therefore then it will be pronounced as Yeshayah. Yeshayahu, 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 Yeshayahu. So there's a slow way of saying it. Yeshayahu, Yeshayahu. But what do they say in Yiddish? They say Shaya, Shaya. It might sound similar and people say it's the same, but if you know Hebrew, it's not the same, right? It's not the same. Right? They say, well, it's just the truncation of the first syllable, but the truncation of the first syllable when we look at the meanings in Hebrew, changes it. And this is a latter-day modification amongst those speakers, right, who have a, lot, a large share in the identification of being Jews and Jewish, speaking about the European Jews, speaking about the Ashkenazi Jews and the Yiddish-speaking Jews. How about Yisrael? Yisrael. Yisrael. Yisrael, right, in the Yiddish sense is Srul, 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 is Srul. They're not the same. Srul, Srul, and Yisrael, Yisrael, and Srul is too different. But you can see the influence of the biblical Hebrew, right, and the adaptation and the integration, so to speak, of Hebrew terminologies, but because of their mother tongue, the way that they enunciate. Right? And many of them even understand this. We've read even, you know, certain um, European Jewish scholars speak about that. The, the heavy influence that their mother tongue and their particular Germanic speech patterns has caused them to even speak, even when they're seeking to speak Biblical Hebrew, the sound of it is different than an original African Afro-Shemitic speaker. Now you have the name of Alexander, Iskinder, Alexander, and they would say as Sender. Right, Alexander Sender. Now that's not really a, a Greek, I mean that's a Greek term, it's not really a Hebrew term, but one might say referential in the Bible, right? Eliezer, 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 Eli Eliezer, Eliezer, right? Notice they say that's Lazar, right? So we can even see the influence among the European um Jewish Yiddish and Ashkenazi speakers. Of the group of the Greek because Lazar like Lazarus with the us the the s at the end this will be more a purely Greek way of speak but Eliezer Eliezer Eli Eliezer 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 right and Lazar is not the same this is just compare right we see it with other variants right you see they will say of Raham av v right they will say basically the b as in a more softer way when you speak the b the bait b b in a soft way it sounds like a v v v it sounds like a it's a soft b sound but to the hearer it sounds like a v sound so they would say avraham avraham that is yiddish influence that's a yiddish influence on the hebrew hebraically it will be Abraham, an African Shemitic enunciation, Abraham, 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 different from Avraham, Avraham, Martin, right? Abraham, Abraham. They would say Avram, right? But actually, if you know the scripture, he was first called Abram, 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 and then he was called, right, Abraham. But the European Yiddish speakers, right, or Yiddish influence speakers, 
of modern Hebrew will say Avraham and Avram. How about the biblical Yehuda? I know many ones and ones will say it's Yah, but that also betrays a poor understanding, right, of, of the Hebrew basics. It's actually Yehuda, Yehuda, which means praise, celebrate it. Modern you, the Jews, right, would say Yuda, Yuda. So we have Yehuda and Yuda. Yehuda and Yuda, somewhat contracted, right? You know, you know, Merged Hebrew. Mordecai, 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 Mordka, Mordka, right? Yaikov, they say Yaikov, V. But actually, African Shemitic speakers would say Yaikov, 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 Marden. Yiddish influence Hebrew is Yaakov, 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 right? They would say Yankel, 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 Yankee, Yankel. What's going on here? Yankel, Yankel, Yosef, Yosef, right? Yosef, biblical, Yosef, Yosef, Yosef. Among Yiddish influence speakers, they say Yosel. So is Yosef, Yosel? No, it's not. Is Yaakov, Yankel? No, it's not, right? So you can see that the the Yiddish speaker influence on the Hebrew, the mother tongue, and then we can see also how Hebrew, even the Hebrew way, is even further influenced, like with Yankel. How do you get Yankel from Yaakov? The answer, Yiddish. Not Hebrew, but Yiddish, right? So Hebrew, Ibrit, Ibrit, right is not yiddish is not yiddish right yiddish so yiddish right is a way of them also identifying right identifying themselves right a way of them identifying what it says a language was it's from eastern europe from eastern europe right from eastern europe right now this was interesting right here this is yiddish colors Another proof, just another proof that Hebrew is not Yiddish. But modern Hebrew has been influenced right, by Yiddish speakers and those with an Eastern European Germanic related dialect. Red, look, look at the, the, the term red. Red is right, right, right. Orange, oranza, or, oranz, orange. Orange, oran, orange, right? Yellow, gale, gale, geal, gale. Green, green, green. Blue, bloy, 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 bloy. Right? Purple, lila, lila or lila. White, vise, vise. Oi, vise, oi, vise, vise. Black, schwartz, schwartz, schwartz. Schwartz, like Schwarzer, Schwartz. You know, we have German Schwartz, right? Here they say Schwartz, 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 Schwartz. This is all colors in Yiddish, in Yiddish. Let's look at colors in more, more Hebrew. Now, even though the Hebrew with the V's, the soft B sound, there's somewhat of a Germanic influence, this is still Hebrew. So what was the last one? Schwartz. Schwarz, Schwarz, right, which is black. Look what is here, right here. It's Shachor, 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 Shachor is Hebrew. Blue, you remember blue? Bloy, Bloy. Remember blue? Bloy. In Hebrew, the blue is Kachol, Kachol, Kachol. Then we even have light blue, right? Tikhelet, 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 Tikhelet or Tikhelet, Tikhelet, light blue. Brown is Chum, Chum. Chum, like we have um, ham, ham, ham. Here, biblical Hebrew, brown is chum, chum, chum. Come from the the more ham sense of heated, like like ham in the Bible, ham. We have chum. Gray is afor, afor, right? Green is yarok, yarok, yarok. Remember green, right? In Yiddish is grin, grin. Grin and Yarok is not one and the same. Remember the orange, 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 sound just like the word orange. What is it in Hebrew? In Hebrew is katom, 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 katom. Pink, 
They have it here. Modern Hebrew pronunciation will be Varod. Ancient pronunciation, Afro-Shemitic is Warod. 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 Right? Purple is Sagol. Sagol. You remember what red was? Reut. 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 R-O-Y-T. Reut. What is red here? Adam. Adam. Like we have Adam. Adam is red. Adam, like that reddish brown, like the Adama, like ground. Like that ground sort of red. Here, once again, we have this right here in the romanticization. Right? Just to demonstrate that Hebrew, right, is not Yiddish. Right? And Yiddish is not Hebrew. So both Chris, you know, and... um Apostles, both of them were, were, were wrong here. And, and, and I think they both surprised me, you know, because when I heard Chris say, said, said, uh, Kohane, <laughs> right? And then Apostle said, that, that's Yiddish. And then Chris said, well, Hebrew is Yiddish. Uh, 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 you know, three strikes right there. But here we have it just in the color wise. Red is Adon. Remember in Yiddish, it's right, right? Orange is katom, katom. In Yiddish, right, is orange, orange, right? Um, yellow was yellow gale. Yellow was like something like gale, gale, right? In Hebrew is sahob, sahob, sahob. Modern Hebrew they'll say sahov, sahov. And modern Hebrew, so that V is more influenced by the speakers. Right, the mother tongue. There's some inability to say certain. You know, if you if you study mother tongues, you'll understand the background. You know, argument and the data. But let's go on to green. Green. Remember that was grin, grin, grin in Yiddish. Right. We have yarok, blue, blue, blue in Yiddish is bloy, bloy, bloy. Sound was just like blue, blue, bloy, blue, bloy. You can see the European right influence. That's not Hebrew. Here, the Hebrew is kahol, 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 blue, right? Purple is sagol, sagol. Brown is chum, 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 related to even the ham, ham sense, the chum, right? And we have black. Remember, it's shvats, shvats. It was shvats, 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 like schwarzer, right? Schwarzer. You know, sometimes that was even used derisively, you know, to um, melanated people of Europe. And even the melanated relation in Europe is also very interesting. That's a whole other argument right there. So we have Shvats, Shvats, right, in Yiddish. But in Hebrew, what do we have? Shachor, Shachor, Shachor. Shachor is black. So this right here demonstrates, just to show you the Yiddish colors again, take a screenshot and compare and contrast. Remember, sagol, purple, right? In Hebrew, sagol. In Yiddish, is lila, lila. Or some might say lila or lila, right? Remember, blue, you know what I mean? Blue is bloy. Green is grin. Yellow is gale. And we show you this right here. Yellow, right? Yellow is a hope. It's a hope. So there's a very clear difference. We're just gonna, we're just gonna even get into the numbers. Right, not even to go into the numbers. Let's say the Yiddish numbers. Ains, Ains, uh, Svei, 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 Ains, Svei, Dry, Dry, Fur, uh, Finef, Zex, right? Zex, Zex, sound like six, 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 sex, sex. Almost like another sex too, but Zex, Zex, six, right? Seven, Zibin, 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 right? Eight, Acht, Acht, Acht. Like oct, like oct, like octo, right? But it's oct. This is Yiddish. Nine is nine, nine, nine. Almost like the German nine. Not, oh, no, not the German. That's uh, Russian, you know, for to say no. But nine, nine, right? And ten is sen, sen, to sen, to sen or sen, 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 right? You, 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 you can basically hear the English all over it. Let's go through the Hebrew for a moment, right? One is ahad. Right, two, Stein or Shetayim. Shetayim, modern Hebrew speakers say Stein, right? Because of that, remember the Yiddish influence, you know, the popularists and the ones who we say are in charge or at the head of the pack, influence, you know, the influence is there. Three is Shalosh. 
right? Four is Arba, right? Five is Hamesh, six is Shes, seven is Sheba, Sheba or modern Hebrew Sheva, right? Eight is Shimone, Shimone, Shimone. Nine is Tesha, Tesha, and ten is Essa, Essa, Essa. Very clear difference. Eins, Eins, Sve, Dry, Fear, Finef, Zex, Zidin, Oct, Nine, Sen. Much difference between Achad. So you have Eins, and then you have Achad. You have Sve, 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 and then you have Shtayim or Shtayi. You have dry, dry for three in Yiddish. You have shalosh, right? You have fur, fur, like four, four, fur, right? In Yiddish, and you have arba, arba. In Yiddish, you have finef, 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 right? For, for, for five, finef, you have chamesh, chamesh in Hebrew. You have zex, zex. Zex is six in Yiddish. You have sheish, sheish, sheish. In Hebrew, you have zibin, 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 right? For seven in Yiddish. You have sheva, modern Hebrew sheva, sheva or sheba, sheba. Almost like sheba, sheba. Eight in Yiddish, you have as oct, 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 right? In Hebrew, you have shimone, 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 eight. Nine in Yiddish sounds almost like nine, 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 right? In Hebrew, you have Tesha, 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 Tesha. Lastly, but not leastly, Zen. You have Zen, Zen. Sounds like, like ten. Zen, Zen. In Hebrew, you have Eser, Eser, Eser. So it's very clear. Right, that the two languages are not one and the same. But yet we must acknowledge there is an influence. Right? More biblical Hebrew, the word for moon is Yareach. Yareach. Right? Um, a modern, more like Yiddish kind of influence word is Lavone. Lavone. Lavan means white. Lavone. And then of course in English the word for moon is moon. Right, but it is this particular man, right, Eliezer ha, uh, ben Yehuda, Eliezer ben Yehuda, that is credited with reviving, right, with reviving what they call modern Hebrew. He's a modern Hebrew revivalist, and yes, Yiddish speaker, of course, he's a Yiddish speaker. But even he made the distinction. What they did was compromise because at this particular point in time, they had already begun to adopt certain Hebrew terminologies in their Germanic Yiddish spoken vernacular. So even with modern Hebrew, there is that mother tongue Yiddish Germanic influence on the pronunciation. Like we say Sheva, right? Sheva. And we also have Sheba, Sheba, right? So this is him right here, you know, and he does deserve certain credit, right, for what he did just from a scholarly perspective. Eliezer, Eliezer ben Yehuda, right? Eliezer ben Yehuda, right? He was born Eliezer Yitzhak Perlman, right? January 7th, 1858 to the 16th of December, 1922. As we mentioned earlier, he was a Hebrew linguist, grammarian, journalist, renowned as a lexicographer of the first, right, Hebrew, quote-unquote, Hebrew dictionary, and the editor of Hadzvi, one of the first Hebrew, and then we go on from there, right? And his aim right here is pointing out right here, speaking about the Hebrew language, in other words, at this particular point, they already knew they only had a pigeon understanding of Hebrew. They only had a pigeon understanding. You know how a pigeon will pick here and pick there? They pick certain words, and we kind of showed you that briefly before. But his idea now, right, was that we need language when we get our land. This is what 
the European Jews working with the Judaic concept and ideas that they have adopted as their own. So he said that the Hebrew language will go from the synagogue to the house of study, right? And from the house of study to the school. And from the school, it will come into the home and become a living language. So he was a visionary on how we're going to really be able to speak Hebrew. Coming from the European Jewish Ashkenazi perspective, they only spoke a pigeon level of Hebrew with prayers and certain other things. And these, the pigeon level of Hebrew that many European, Eastern European Jews spoke was heavily influenced by Germanic and other linguistic f factors, Slavic, Romance language factors. But Yiddish in itself is a Germanic based language. Now, even the one that they call um, uh, this this one right here, his name escapes me. Oh, Theodore Herz, Herzl, right? He said, today I met the young fanatic who tried to convince me that what our movement needs is to adopt Hebrew as our national language. This was Theodore Herzl. He was the he was one who was strongly part of that move to establish a European Jewish state, right, in the, well, first it was in Africa, but then they focused with the, with the Rothschild and with the um, Balfour Declaration, they focused on the Levant and on some promises that was made to them by the British. But he thought it was ridiculous, right? He was out to get the land. Now notice, he is saying right here, Theodore Herzl, his personal diary, from 1898, he was recounting his meeting with Eliezer ben Yehuda, reviver of the Hebrew language. It's almost like right now amongst I and I people, right? Rastafari Jews, Rastafari Israelite, Rastafari Rabbi, I and I, you know, are seeking to also, you know, emphasize the importance of linguistics. And you know what many ones and ones think? Just like Theodore Herzl. They, they think we need to get our own land. So from some, we agree with them. But we're saying that that what the movement needs might is our own afro-semitic afro-asiatic linguistics we need our language right the language is the key as his imperial master the mama hala Selassie, the conquering line of the tribe of judah says that language is the key of communication between man and man his imperial majesty the conquering line of the tribe of judah also says to us that communication is the key to culture, the key of culture, right? This is what's so very interesting is that even among the European Jews, some of the leading proponents for what the European Jews were seeking to do from the 1800s on forward, such as Theodor Herzl, he thought that Eliezer ben Yehuda was absolutely ridiculous and crazy. He said he met the young fanatic who tried to convince him that what the Jewish movement, the European Jewish movement of that time needed was to adopt Hebrew as our national language. And he said, it is, of course, ridiculous. But now, look at it now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Same thing with us when we are pushing as Rastafari and Royal Order of the Ethiopian Hebrews pushing our Afro-Shemitic language. Many of our own people probably think, and we know already they think it's ridiculous. You know, learning the language. Even many Rastafari was, was teaching the Amharic, teaching his Majesty's Bible and teaching them to be able to read and speak the royal Amharic. Many of them think it's ridiculous too. They prefer the Patois, right, to continue to teach a broken, a broken language, right? You know, a broken and, uh, you know, language that has a lot of trauma and limitation to it than to teach our youths, right, you know, the biblical Hebrew, Right, therefore, we have a link right there with the Gutters, and of course, the key, right, we would say is the Amharic as Dr. Malaku Emmanuel Bayan taught us. So, this is a little clearer of that first meme we showed how he said this is the fanatic that Theodore Herzl, the founder of some people say Zionist movement, so forth and so on. This is who he was talking about. The Hebrew language will go from the synagogue to the house of study and from the house of study to the school and from the school it will come into the home and become a living language. And in the European Jewish and this modern context, this is basically true and this has been done. So 
the linguistics is very important. So I hope my brothers and sisters, you know, take note of why we're doing what we're doing and why we keep emphasizing, right? You know, even sometimes people say maybe ad nauseum, the significance of the linguistics, right? Let's just share this right here, right? Let's share this right here. We, we looked up gutters, right? Gutters, right? Some people say geese, but really gutters, 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 right? Right? Because it's the opening of the mouth, right? Many of you all into Kemet, ancient Egypt might be familiar with that. This is what we need. We need the opening of the mouth. Right, the opening of the mouth. So right here, here, here. Right, um, tsehafata, tsehafata, Israelawi. It's interesting article. I didn't even zoom in on this article right here. Need to go back to, but we was looking up this right here is gutters. Right now, here is the key for us in learning biblical Hebrew, but. Here is also the key of the European Jews in being able to restore Hebrew as a modern spoken language because of their researches into Ethiopia, into the Beta Israel, the black Jews, the Ethiopian Jews of Ethiopia, into their research in the Ethiopian claims and in their manuscripts and in their documentation. We have proof of this, Halevi and others was very heavy while Eliezer ben Yehuda was doing what he was doing. They were like intelligence gathering, not just even from Ethiopia, but other parts of Africa, because if you get into their own writings, you'll get to recognize that they even see a pre-familiarity right, with what they have come into after 740 AD. In other words, they know that there were others right, who were Hebrew, Judaic peoples, and had more of what they needed. This is why there's a whole lot of Jewish study in Ethiopia. I'm talking about going back like to the 1800s and, and the early 1900s, right? All of this familiarity helped them, right, with um, reviving Hebrew in the more fuller sense as we see today. This is one of the, the keys to the value of having the people, the Beta Israel of Ethiopia and even others and research into whether it's the Lemba people, whether it's the, you know, the Igbo, Igbo people, whether it's the Beta Israel people, so forth and so on, right? You know, to a less extent, us, we the black people, Beta Israel and Americans and criminals, because they recognize that we've gone through that 400 years where a lot of this was stripped from us. But there's other aspects that are in our soul, our psyche, that even European Jews study. This is why the black Jewish relationship always has been so close. What they call politically the black Jewish relationship. Because you know, we say that we, the Beta Israel, we so called black people are Beta Israel. But this is what, this is where, you know, the wrestling comes on because they say, no, we're not. So from something that some of y'all may agree with them. But look what it says right here Is Gutters older than Hebrew? The Gutters language is considered even older than the Hebrew. Now, of course, among a lot of the academic scholars, a lot of this is debated, right? A lot It's debated in some public forums, but then in certain private peer review papers, right, even coming out of um, Hebrew University in, in, in Israel, that really points to the significance of the Gutters and the Ethiopic languages. This is why even with the airlift of the Beta Israel, like what they call the Falashas, right, of Ethiopia, a lot of their manuscripts, right, was the, taken directly to Hebrew University and there was a big, and has been a big fight among those in the community, the Kahin, Right, Kahin, Kohen, both acceptable ways of saying priests. Many of the priests in the um, um, Beta Israel community from Ethiopia that have been arguing vehemently to have access to their own ancient documents. So when they had airlift, I think it was Operation Solomon or Moses, one of the operations, they had the majority of people on one or two planes, right? You know, and they had all of their books. On another plane, the people were so happy to touch down in the state of Israel, 
that for a moment they forgot about their books and their books was hustled or taken directly to Hebrew University for what? For, they would say, preservation and research. This is what the Hebrew University and the, we could say the European Jewish, the other side, they argue, well, they did this not to take these manuscripts from the people, but for pres preservation and for research. And you know what? I partly believe them on that, the European Jews, because they already know the value of studying the Gutters. They already can understand, you know, the links between the Gutters, which is a pure, a pure Shemitic language, right? A pure, what they call a Shemitic language, right? Which is considered by the scholars that really are in the real know. Because you have other scholars who are just defending you know, certain political agendas. There are some scholars who are just defending a political point of view. You know, when we talk about Zionism, the state of Israel, so you have to understand that some of them in defending that particular political point of view are only going to, you know, say certain things because it's going to go against their big, the big picture. But here, 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 let's share this right here. The Gutters language is considered even older than the Hebrew language and other such northern Semitic languages and other such northern Semitic languages. So that means that there are Semitic languages, Shemitic, I'll say African Shemitic languages spoken, Afro-Shemitic languages in the north, but there's also the south. And we know that the Queen of Sheba was called the Queen of the what? In the Bible, the Queen of the South. Scholars believe that the language to be around 5,000 years old. Some also consider it the father, right, or respectively the mother, but let's just say the father here, the father of all languages. And it's still spoken in Ethiopia. It's used as a liturgical, right, language, some say spiritual religious language by Orthodox Christians in the region. This is a good article right here, home study right here. So it's good as older than Hebrew. The question you have to ask is, why have scholars, I'm talking about like European Jewish scholars, over the past hundred, mm, I would say hundred plus years, right? I'll say hundred, hundred and fifty, but the study has been even older, other scholars, but more, there's the, the, more like a, a concerted effort to really study as much as possible of Ethiopia while still questioning. See, and they'll put out false things saying like, oh, the Falashas are not, the Beta Israel are not familiar with Hebrew. That's, they'll say that in some of these documentaries. They even say the sound of it is new to them. No, the sound of European Jewish speakers speaking it is new. But as ones get into the roots, you know what I mean? This is why we show this right here where we can see the Hebrew and the Ethiopic. Right, you can see the Hebrew and the Ethiopic side by side. That, and when we say the Ethiopic, we're talking about the Gutters, the Gutters side by side, the Hebrew and the Ethiopic. Right, this is the level of study, right, that the higher European Jewish and other scholars are really on. Now, you have some who have a limited understanding of it. And we'll say it's not because of some research out there. But then there's the other research. The more heavier research basically points to what we just showed you, right? The more heavier research that it seems to have an antiquity, the gutters. Why? How do we know this? Because of words and word roots. Anyone who understands linguistics and the shoresh, like the, the verb and word roots, when we start to see the word roots and the more archaic um, writing of it. You know, it's almost like today when people write, we're like writing less, you know, you know, like now we have acronyms, we're abbreviating things where we have like a short, like short script, like a, what, what do you call it? Um, shorthand. There's like a shorthand way of writing nowadays, you know what I'm saying? But then we see like even expression, like everything's quicker. But so we then look into the past and we can see some of the older forms of the word right some of some there are words in the bible that they were not able to figure out Jesenius and Jesenius's lexicon and others were not able to figure out if you look into his lexicon Jesenius right lexicon you begin and which is a background to the strong's concordance 
you will find that is heavily repl replete with Gutter's references, Ethiopic Gutter's references, whenever they are in doubt, right, about a word or whenever they are in doubt about the meaning of a word, right? Because there are some words in the Bible that sometimes they will say these words is archaic or foreign origin, you know what I mean? You know, it's like a foreign origin. But what clears it up is the Ethiopic. Now, many ones talk about the Paleo-Hebrew. There are Paleo forms, so-called like ancient forms of the Ethiopic that begin to have a direct match and also the Sabian, right? Sabian, Queen of Sheba, the Sabian influence. So putting this all together, we get to recognize that there was a, a linguistic family it's like in the Ethiopic and the Afro-Shemitic languages are like the European Romance languages. You know how French, you know, German, Italian, you know, Spanish are different languages. But yet there's a lot of common roots. There's a lot of commonality. That's why they are all referred to as Roman languages or so-called Romance languages. So in other words, Hebrew can be biblical biblical hebrew that is right can be included within the ethiopic category of afro shemitic languages just to show some of the older forms right here mm -hmm. just showing some of the older forms right here and when ones talk about you know like the the paleo writing and then talk about relations with things like arabic script here we have the sabian script Right, remember the Queen of the South, the Queen of Sheba, the Sabian script, and now the Sabian script, like of the Queen of Sheba, displays Shemitic and Afro Shemitic roots. So, this now helps us when we want to discern well, what is the possible Sabian links, right, in the Bible? This is where we get um, Abraham's third wife, Keturah, the whole Keturah link within that biblical narrative. Right, so here's where we find that there was a linguistic similarity, right? Linguistic similarities. So here, when ones then want to take it way back, take it even before, right? The the Proto-Ethiopic, when we get to the pictograph. So we have the Gutters, right? As we have today, right? In its this form, then we have the early the proto ethiopic like we have the proto synaptic script, right? Before even as we look at the font system, we call this like a font system. You know what fonts are in your computer? This is what we have. We have the pictograph is a particular kind of font. Remember who told you this? Ras Iodonis, right? It's a font, right? In other words, we're trying to find ways of helping to clarify, right? and make simple, make easy on the ground in a way you can understand. So some will say, oh, the Paleo Hebrew is the one and not this later Hebrew. This is a development, an evolution of, 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 of fontography. We have many different fonts in the English language, yet very few would say that the different fonts make English a different language because you can write this in this font and you could change it to Times, Helvetica, Arial. You know, if I write an English word in Arial, does that make it different when I put it into Times Roman or into Helvetica? It's still the same word. This is how the ancients understood and one was able to even understood other people's dialects and linguistics, right? From the pictograph to the which some will say is the proto synaptic to the proto ethiopic so forth and so on but of course science and the academics are kind of hard pressed giving the credit to civilization right language which is a, a powerful thing development of language not just speaking language but written language you know going way back from the pictograph time right to even the different fonts that simplify it right into less pictorial but we can see the basic general relationship between one and the other so we see even the comedic right and the ethiopic links you know the comedic and the ethiopic this would be considered like the ethiopic and comedic alpha and omega or in the hebrew the aleph tau the aleph tau right hebraically right 
Ethiopically, we say the ha pe, the ha pe. And those who are into some of the comedic studies, you know there's a relationship with that sound, the ha pe. What is the ha pe or ha pi, right? It's to be, as a glyph, it's the head and the tail of a reclining lion, right? And also the link of the lion, right? We have it more to the afro shemitic regions, the Horn of Africa, right? Then we have it to Levant as an animal. So even in the biblical narrative, the lion is a significant symbol, right? In the Hebraic and Israelite narrative. And that's also Afro-Asiatic and Afro-Shemitic. It's not so much native to that particular region of the world. You know what I mean? We have the, the African or the Ethiopian lion. And then we have the Asian lions, right? So within the biblical narrative, they must have been pointing to a symbol, a symbology that was not just older than them, but also found in other regions that they understood and knew were regions of beginning or of the beginnings. Now, this is interesting right here. We have El, we have Gazi, we have Behay, and we have Bir. Right? Almost like Egeziabi here. Right? But what's interesting is the first the first one at the top is El. Like like in the Hebrew when we say the Almighty Power, the God, El. Right? And now the ligature kind of brings them two together. It shows how ancient peoples sometimes were creative in how they took the individual um syllables and phonetics and combine them to even make interesting and new glyphs right we're seeing this in the ethiopic right here right as well as working from the old egyptian right and seeing the kind of evolution of ancient fonts right font or writing system right here as well we're giving just some variations right of the ethiopic you know, writing. Now, here, 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 right? I think we touched on this right here before, right? Let's just share this right here to the question, is Gutters older than Hebrew? The question, right? The Gutters language is a South Semitic. When I say South Semitic, I want you to keep in mind the Queen of the South, the Queen of the Afro-Semitic South. The Gutters language is a South Semitic language of Afro-Asiatic origins. So what it's putting, when it's put Afro, it puts the ancient black peoples, right, at the origination, even of what later is called the Asiatic culture, coming out of Sumer and Mesopotamia and the Aram Naharaim, right, used in countries like Ethiopia and Eritrea. It is even believed to be a parent language of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics and that's from the scholars that have done their research but in order for a scholar to do their research on these sort of levels they have to have a good working knowledge of the goods and we want to heal up Legacy Alen Legacy Alen you know what I mean you know Legacy Alen the work by brother Legacy Alen and his particular books right as well right so a little bit of home study right here so brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers right here, I think we've gone through some of the basics right here, you know, to make this particular, to give this particular demonstration, right? This particular demonstration. And let's kind of seal up where we kind of began that Hebrew, right? Hebrew is not, not Yiddish. Is not Yiddish? What? Hebrew is not Yiddish. Shalom, Chabarim, Shalom, or Shabbat Shalom, Sembet Salam. You know, we just said, let's just do this and try to make it as clear as possible. Give some basic points of reference, you know. And if ones want to debate or dispute this, well, as we say, you know, let the games begin. Shalom, Chabarim, Shalom. This is Yadin. This is Wendem Yadin. All right, Ross, I don't, and I and I approve of this message.